Hi everybody, you're at home with Melissa and we are in the partially deconstructed kitchen uh, along with Randy and what we're going to be talking about today are three very common parasites that you might encounter particularly you know in your cats particularly if they're outdoor cats or if they're cats who are primarily indoor cats who occasionally or regularly do go outside and by saying that you're going to have to deal with these I don't necessarily mean that your animal's going to become infected. You can take some steps to kind of prevent that, but uh, outdoor cats do come in contact with everything that's outdoors. So it stands to reason that they can bring things in with them and you don't want them to do that. And you certainly don't want to let the problem continue. So the first thing we want to talk about and I'll tell you a bit about Randy after we talk about the facts that we need to cover today, okay? Uh, that way, if you're interested in getting the factual information on the parasites but really don't care to hear Randy's story, then, you know, you can shut off the video once that's done. But the three things we're going to discuss are worms, not heartworms, roundworms and flatworms, and ticks and fleas. And I'm keeping an eye out, if you're wondering why I keep looking over there. Gracie likes to harass Randy, and I've put up a bit of a barricade here. It's, this is basically not being used as a kitchen right now because it is torn apart. So I have a table here. I use it as a work area for different things, you know, when I'm doing anything dirty or whatever. But, uh, so I have little messes that I've created and that I keep creating as I'm working in here and uh, since Randy's here with me Gracie's thinking she might have access to him so she's checking it out and I don't want her to get nearby because if she does he'll flip out she'll flip out and it'll just be a mess we want a nice calm relaxed video home bum and so we're going to talk about those three parasites, three types of parasites. And let's start with, well, let's start with the worms, okay? Uh, and I just want to discuss flatworms and roundworms. And your flatworms include things like the tapeworm. And you're usually not going to see live tapeworms outside of the animal's body what will happen, I'm petting Gracie if you're wondering what's going on now, um, it, you might see a few segments that the worm has sloughed off, dead segments on the outside of the animal's body, but generally the worm itself is going to be in the intestinal tract there of the animal. Now with roundworms it's a different story. With roundworms sometimes you will find dead or dying worms in the animal's stools or vomit if the animal has thrown up. And basically what they look like is they're three to six inches long and they're very thin round worms kind of pointed on either end and they look a lot like really thin pasta. I hate to say that. Until you get a good look, realize what they are, get totally grossed out but they're not necessarily going to be in the stools and things. So what are some of the symptoms that your animal might be infected with worms? Well, first of all, he might have a really extended, hard, round body. And if you have a pregnant female, obviously that's gonna be the same thing looks-wise going on. So, you know, that's just one of the possible symptoms. Another is a pretty well continual cough. An animal with worms will often just keep coughing. The distended belly, diarrhea, intestinal upset, and with diarrhea, like I said, you might see worms in the stools. You might also, oh, honey, we're treating someone here, huh? Uh, you might also see some blood in the stools. But these can also be symptoms of other things. So, unless you're absolutely sure, you don't want to treat your animal for worms. Now, if you've actually seen roundworms in the stool, and you know the animal has roundworms, you can go and get the roundworm treatment, 
and medicate and treat the animal for roundworms. Now it's not a one-time thing because of the life cycle of the worms, you've got the worms, you've got the eggs, etc. And so I think the treatment's like every two or three weeks and you're going to have to keep doing that. Basically when you get your worm medication it will give you detailed instructions including how often you have to remedicate the animal. And you want to do this, you want to follow the instructions to the T. And because what will happen if you don't is that eggs will hatch and things and you'll be right back to where you started from with the animal being infected. And what these worms do, and this is true of flatworms and roundworms, since they live in the intestinal tract in the digestive system, they'll absorb the nutrients that your animal takes in through its food and that your animal really needs for your animal's health. Now, if you're thinking something along the lines of, well, okay, then I'll just keep giving my animal as much as it wants to eat, high nutrients, high vitamins, and things like that so that the animals still get the nutrients it needs in spite of the worms. Not a good idea. I, you probably would never think to do something like that anyway, but not a good idea because that's not the only problem, especially with like, say the round worms, for example, they won't necessarily stay in that digestive tract. They can actually migrate out and go elsewhere, say, for example, to the animal's lungs. Hmm. Yeah. You definitely don't want that. So what you want to do is you want to find out what's going on as quickly as possible and start the medication process. And something that you ought to be aware of also is that the medication for flatworms or roundworms is different and the one won't kill the other. So it's important that you know what kind of worm you're dealing with. You don't want to give your animal medication. Uh, for a problem it doesn't have and you don't want to medicate the animal when the medication's not going to help at all with the problem your animal does have. So again, unless you see the roundworms in the stool or the vomit, you can't really be 100% sure what the problem is with your animal. It might not even be worms, it could be something else. So if that's the case, make sure to take the animal to the veterinarian and you might you know, depending on how you feel about things, you can see Gracie in the background now. She's like, what are you doing? You're talking. Um, so you might even want to have the veterinarian do the treatments and just take the animal back to the vet every few weeks until the problem is completely solved. So that's how you deal with worms. Now, another problem with an animal with worms is that those eggs pass through the stool and can thereby be contracted by other animals or by you. Mm, yeah, not good. So again, find out as quickly as possible what's going on. Go to the vet if you're not absolutely sure what you're dealing with and have the vet determine it and the vet can even do the treatments for you if that's what you'd like. So that's all we have really to say about worms. What we want to talk about next is the tick. And those of you who watch this channel on a regular basis, you've seen, uh, you're aware of the fact that I've had Lyme disease before and um, that I've done some videos on Lyme disease. It's a real concern, even with your pets. If your animal's going outside, it's probably, or if it's been an outdoor animal, it's probably going to have some ticks on it. And so what you want to do is anytime the animal comes into the house, you want to check it for ticks. When the tick first attaches itself to the animal to feed, it uses its mouth parts to make a little hole. It hangs on tight and it starts to suck the blood. Yeah. And at first, it's just a tiny, tiny little bug. But very quickly, we're talking very quickly, um, not days, you know, that day you're going to be able to see it. And... It's easy to mistake a tick for, say, a skin tag or something. Um, if you feel them, they feel fleshy. If you would try to pull it, which I do not recommend, it would feel, they really stick on there. It would feel like part of the animal. So, okay, well then, if it looks like a skin tag, feels like a skin tag, and you shouldn't pull on it like that, how do you know if it's a tick? Well, the way I do it is I get down through the animal's hair, Okay, say the ticks right here. I pull the hair away, just 
I like this. See, Randy's the perfect model for this because he is just such a sweetie and he's so calm and he lets us do anything we want. Okay, so you've got this thing that looks like a skin tag. And you get down and you look very closely, getting a magnifying glass or your glasses on or whatever if you need to. And down right at the base where it meets with the regular skin, you can see what looks like a dark ring around the base of it. Brown or black, most likely black. And you're looking at it. What that would likely be is where the legs of the tick actually are. Yeah, it's gross. But if you get especially a magnifying glass, then you'll be able to see those actual individual legs and and things. So you want to get rid of that as quickly as possible because you don't want to leave the tick on uh, feeding until it's done and is allowed to drop off because ticks carry not only Lyme disease, but lots of other diseases, lots of diseases. And you, the longer it's on their feeding, the more likely it is that through its what, saliva, uh, as it's feeding, it's going to inject spirochetes, viruses, whatever horrible thing the tick might be carrying, it can inject into your pet. And the longer it's there, the longer it has to do that. Now, traditionally, a way people have removed the ticks is they get a tissue and put it over the tick and just pull it off. I don't recommend that at all. I do not recommend that. The reason is that as you do that, you're squeezing that tick and you're causing it to inject more of whatever diseases or parasites or whatever it has into your pet. And we don't want that. No way, not for our buddy. So, um, what you want to do is you want to get down to the base of the animal and get it off that way. They do sell, and they're very cheap, tick removal tools. If you have an animal that goes outdoors, I recommend that you get one of those. And that will help you safely remove the tick. Likewise, you don't want to burn it. That will also cause the tick to inject more of whatever is inside the tick into your animal and infect it possibly with contagions and, and things like that, horrible things. And Lyme disease itself, um, people used to kind of ignore it in a way or discount it as being anything serious. It's very serious. Uh, it leads to symptoms that cause the animal, and if you have it, cause you severe suffering and neurological problems and even death can result and so you don't want that for your animal. Now there are and if again if your animal goes outside on a regular basis I definitely recommend this or if your animal goes outside ever. Uh, cats, dogs, there are Lyme disease vaccinations. I really highly recommend you get the animal vaccinated against Lyme disease. Now that's not the only disease that ticks carry though. So again, you want to remove them as quickly as possible. You also, and possibly even more importantly, want to prevent the ticks from staying on the animal in the first place and needing to be removed. And there are medications and things out there that will do that. There are the little drops that are used to uh, kill and ward off fleas that you put between the cat's shoulder blades. You can use those. And I, I think that, in my opinion, and again, run this by your veterinarian if you have any question. But I think that um, that the drops that go between the shoulder blades is the treatment I most prefer that I think is most effective. You can also get flea and tick collars. And I think it's important that if you do, uh, particularly if your animal goes outdoors, you want to get a breakaway collar. They have... A little clasp that breaks away if that collar gets caught on something that way your animal's not strangled you know I mean can you imagine so you know if your animal's going outside you want to make sure that if that collar gets caught in anything the animal can throw the collar off and get away and not be harmed and the breakaway collars are really good for this um, Regardless what kind of collar you're using, if you're putting a collar on your cat, you want to put it tight enough that it stays on, but loose enough that your cat can breathe. You know, just take your little finger and see. Make sure there's some space between the collar and the cat's neck, okay? Um, 
and that's a good way to get it on. And generally those collars are going to be a lot longer than you need for the diameter of your cat's neck. I like to put the collar on the animal first and then leaving just a little bit, you know, if, if it's, if you're putting a collar and it's got, say, a latch and you're putting the collar through it and you have extra length of collar there, I like to put it on the animal first and then cut the excess off. And the reason I like that better is just that it's easier to get the collar on the animal that way. Now, uh, I'm trying to think if I've thought of, oh, and if you've seen my videos, I've mentioned this before and I think it's important, so I probably mention it every time I talk about ticks. And that is the fact that there used to be two different companies who manufactured Lyme disease vaccinations for humans. They didn't feel they were making enough profit off them and pulled them from the market. So now, at least here in northeastern United States, Lyme disease is considered to be epidemic at this point. And with global warming, it's likely to get worse, not better. But we no longer have vaccinations for humans. We still have them for cats and dogs. Very important you get that taken care of. Now, Lyme disease isn't just found in the United States. I don't know where all it's found, but I do know that it's found in Britain. And scientists think that how it got there is infected ticks being carried on migratory birds from the United States over. And people in Australia, I know, are also um, being diagnosed with Lyme disease. They're, they're testing positive for it. And I don't know, I would imagine that by now the Australian government is recognizing that they do have Lyme disease in the nation, but I'm not certain on that. I know until recently, the government wasn't recognizing that Lyme disease was a problem in Australia, but people were being, who had never left Australia, were being diagnosed positive, were being tested positive for Lyme disease. And so, you know, if you live in Australia, you've never left and you test positive for Lyme disease, obviously, there's Lyme disease in Australia. So those are some little added tidbits about Lyme disease. And now we'll move on to fleas. Talk about those. Again, fleas are a big problem and, you know, going to be an ever increasing problem with global warming. Even in places that have cold winters, in those areas, the cold winters usually kill off some of the, uh, fleas that are out there to be found, but with warmer and warmer winters, that's the kill off's not going to be as great and the population density of fleas is going to be greater. And again, like with ticks, fleas carry a lot of diseases. In fact, uh, fleas on rats are generally believed, or at least unless things have changed, and I don't think they have, uh, generally believed to be responsible for the Black Death that passed through Europe, killing off a third of its population back in the day. Uh, that was spread by fleas. There, you know, we know of a lot of different diseases that are spread by fleas. So even though they seem like tiny little harmless things, they're not. And so you don't want to allow a flea infestation to continue, uh, even if they didn't cause disease, they do cause your animal itching and they miserable. Huh? And, you know, it would be this, you'd be getting bit by them as well if you have a flea infestation. Now, if you bring an animal into the house that has fleas, uh, you're going to need to treat for it. How do you know if it has fleas? Well, if you dig through their hair down to the base near the skin, as you're pulling the hair apart, if your animal will let you, like Randy, he's a good boy. Um, you'll see fleas moving around in the hair probably. And you can feel, as you're feeling the animal down on the skin, you can feel kind of a grittiness. And if you look, it looks like little black grit. Now that's flea eggs. So that would mean that you probably have fleas. And 
you know, they're going to hang out in your house. They're going to get on you, bite you, get on your other pets, bite them, hang out in upholstered furniture and things like that. Uh, if you end up with a flea infestation, you might want to, you know, this is up to you. You might want to have exterminators in to take care of it. And again, let them know that you have pets and that, you know, what pets you have and make sure to follow their instructions as to what you need to do to, to keep your pets safe for whatever spraying they're doing and things like that. Um, I don't have any upholstered furniture. If I get a flea infestation, uh, mopping everything with hot water and maybe vinegar and things will kill them off. Um, and as far as killing them off on your pet, there's one way that I know of that is easy and that is a flea comb. Flea comb is just like a lice comb that you would use if your child has head lice. They're made exactly the same. They'll work for fleas, they'll work for lice, they'll get the nits, they'll get the eggs. So it's a good thing to have. And so what you can do if you need one either for your child or your pet is to look both where uh, head lice supplies and pet supplies are found in your stores and buy whichever one's cheaper and what you do with it. Now this one has one side has a little bit more space between the tines and that'll get the live fleas. The other has close tine, even closer tines that'll get the eggs. Okay. And you take and you comb close to the skin very close to the skin. Now, be careful as you're doing that. See, there's none there, but um, be careful as you're doing that because as you're coming along, if your pet actually has skin tags or any kind of growths or scabs, and if your cat's infested with fleas, your cat's probably been scratching and uh, probably has some scabs down in there. Be careful not to hurt your animal, but you want to get right down close to the skin because those fleas hang out right next to the skin. The eggs are right next to the skin and things like that because the fleas eat blood. So obviously they have to be close to the skin in order to feed and their little eggs are down there as well. So you're going to comb, 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 get out the, the fleas. And then what you want to do is you want to kill off the fleas and the eggs that are on your comb once you're done combing. And the way to do that is to just soak it in a container of vinegar, um, cup, mug, jar, whatever. And that'll kill off the fleas. That'll kill off the eggs. And, you know, you can just leave it in there for five minutes or so, or you can leave it in. Randy likes being combed, so I'm just going to keep combing him. Um, but, uh, whoops, he has a little scab there, but, um, I usually leave the comb sit in the vinegar for like a half an hour or so, and then rinse it off because vinegar is acidic and you want to rinse off the acid. You don't want it to be uh, sitting on the comb and maybe eating away, especially if it's, you know, eating away at your plastic or your metal or what have you. So uh, rinse it in vinegar once you're done and that'll kill off any little fleas or eggs. Oh yeah, that's so nice. You like that. Any little fleas or eggs that are on your comb. And so that is one method for removing them. Now, I don't think, let me just toss that over in the sink. I don't think, because I'm tired of dealing with it. Um, <laughs> I don't think the odds are in favor of your being able to completely eradicate fleas by combing. You're going to miss spots. You're going to miss eggs. You're going to miss fleas. So, you know, if the animal only has a few fleas, perhaps you'll be able to completely get rid of the problem by combing. Now, remember, as with the worms, your fleas are living their life cycle on the animal, and so they've got eggs and things like that. You're going to have to do more than one treatment in order to kill the fleas that have come along since you did your last treatment. If you're doing the combing, if you're doing, say, a flea bath, um, cats generally, oh, look at his little face, cats generally don't like baths, so... You know, there are other ways to deal with fleas on them. And, hi, sweetheart. What? You wompy. It's wompy. Okay, there are other ways to deal with fleas. And, um, one 
is the drops that go between their shoulder blades and he's at the perfect position to show you. Now if you can't see the shoulder blades you can feel them. You know here's the neck and at the base of the neck right behind that you'll feel two bony structures standing up and the drops that go on the cats to kill and you can get them to kill fleas and ticks goes between the shoulder blades. You feel those two. Hi sweetheart. Hi. I am you. Yeah. Um, you'll feel those two lumps and you'll put the drops between them. Now don't just drop it onto the animal because again remember your fleas live close to the skin and so you want to get your drops and get the nozzle from your dropper, separate the hair, get right down to the skin and put your drops directly on your oh hi baby directly on your animal's skin yeah you're going to be with mama directly on your animal's skin yeah you're your pretty oh sorry I made you itchy in your ear he is a dover look at his little ears sticking out there itching I think it's cause his hair itch oh yeah he's like no I don't like that now <laughs> you made me itch He's not itching over there, just when he comes over here. I don't know why I made his ears itch, but, um, sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering what he was doing. Um, so, again, the drops will go right on the skin between the shoulder blades. Oh, hi, honey. And, yeah. And another... And you can get them so that it keeps... That it kills and keeps away ticks and fleas, and I am... You know, that is what I suggest you do. And, and, you know, you can get the collars as well. And so if you do the the drops or the collar, I recommend, again, that you follow any instructions to the letter. And we are going to be doing some of these. You know, when I combed him, I didn't see any fleas on the comb just now. But that's not because he doesn't have them. He does. He has no ticks. He did when he came to me, but we took care of that. He also has roundworms, and I actually did see them in his stool. So we're medicating for that, huh, Bubba? And so I think we've covered basically everything that we need to cover for the fleas, ticks, and worms. I can't think of anything I've missed. But again, like like I've said before, if you have anything that you feel should be added to that, uh, feel free to leave a message in the comment section to let our viewers know. And if there are any questions you have that I haven't addressed, leave a comment in the comment section and I'll try to get back to you and uh, answer your questions. And if I don't know, I'll try to look it up for you, call vets, whatever I have to do to find out. Now. Since we're done talking about our little parasitic friends, not friends, frenemies, since we're talking, no, just enemies, since we're ta done talking about the parasites, I'll tell you a little bit about Randy, what he's doing here, and uh, I'll get cat hair in my nose, uh, what he's doing here and how he came to be with me, a bit about his history and his family history and everything else. So, um, you know, if you don't want to hear that, we're done talking about the parasites, I think, and so you can just turn the the video off. But now it's time to tell you a little bit about Randy himself. Randy actually came to me from my farm friend's farm, uh, my friend Jennifer and her family. And he is and isn't a rescue kitty. It's not a situation like it is with Chloe and Gracie where they were horribly abused and, and things like that and had to be rescued twice and, and now they're with me. Um, I've always said I can comfortably house three cats. Didn't want to bring another cat into the house really uh, before, you know, thinking about the whole idea in general because Chloe and Gracie had been together their whole lives and they love one another and they love me and I love them. And anytime you have a cat or dog in a house and you bring another one in, it's going to change the dynamic of the household. Even if everyone gets along, things are going to change. And, you know, everything was so great and I didn't want it to change. So I thought I'm not going to bring another cat in. But Randy's a special case and Randy has special needs. 
and I've known Randy since he was literally just a little baby, and he's like four or five years old now. And uh, way back, like uh, probably three generations or four generations of, of farm cats ago, I had taken a really big white cat with gray tiger stripe markings on him to the farm, uh, to, to live, you know, with their permission, of course. And he wasn't fixed. They, they like their animals not to be because, you know, they like them to repopulate themselves because on the farms, you know, cats run around and, you know, they help keep mice and rats, things that can eat your crops and ruin things. They, they keep them at bay, you know, keep the populations of the pests down. So, and my friends actually take really good care of their farm cats. They feed them because domesticated cats, you know, you hear some people say that, you know, if they have farm cats, that they don't feed them because they want them hungry, so they'll hunt. Well, domesticated cats are notorious. They hunt whether they're hungry or not. So Jennifer and her family, they feed the cats and um, they name them. There are tame cats and there are feral cats. I would say the majority of the cats that run around on their farm are tame. And the reason is, anytime they find a litter of cats, they handle them, they hold them. Uh, if an animal gets, you know, a wild animal kills a mama cat, they hand raise the babies and do whatever they need to do that way. But they handle them a lot from the time they're small thereby ensuring that the kittens are handled a lot in that that critical first six weeks of life that you need to handle kittens if you really want them to really like being petted and cuddled and things. Uh, because if they don't really have a lot of interaction with humans in that first six weeks of life, odds are they're never really going to warm up to people. They might come around them to eat and things like that, but... They're not going to really want to be touched and loved up. You know, odds are very much against that ever happening if the animal's not used to people by then. And so they play with their kittens and they hold them and they touch them. I mean, look how much Randy's the most loving of the three cats here. And so anyway, <clears throat> the cat that I took was huge. And as you can see, Randy's huge. And they didn't have any other really large cats running around the farm at the time that Randy's mom became pregnant. So we think that Randy is the grandson of the fella that I took out there. And Randy's mom was this pretty little dainty blonde kitty. Um, she had tiger stripes, if I remember correctly. Maybe not. But she was really blonde, really pale colored hair and she was really sweet because she had been hand raised by Jennifer she and her brother Max who was also a giant kitty and they had been hand raised by Jennifer and cared for and cuddled and coddled and and mama's name was Sophia and when the babies were born she had four kittens one was Randy here one was Randy's brother Ralphie they were named after the main characters in that movie, A Christmas Story. And Ralphie had Randy's 